Flight 299 is cleared for takeoff. The 727 is seconds away from leaving the ground. But danger lies ahead. A DC-9 is stopped halfway down the runway. In the cockpit, Captain Bill Lovelace and First Officer Jim Schifferns are lost in the fog. This is a runway. Yeah. The commuter flight from Belfast, Northern Ireland, was supposed to land in Cork at 9 a.m. Maybe Kerry. 30 minutes later, it's still circling the airport. Cork faces out to the Atlantic, so fog is, is very common. Uh, and fog will roll in, and it will roll out, uh, sometimes at no notice. In our part of the world, we have a, a saying, it was like pea soup, because it was very, very thick. Hope we land soon. I've got work to do. There are 10 passengers waiting to land this morning, including Lawrence Wilson, traveling to Cork for the day on business. I was going to Cork to do forklift truck training. I had been in that same location, doing the same course uh, several times before. So it was sort of really old hat to go down. I've done it before. Today's flight is aboard a Fairchild Metro 3. Flying the plane today is First Officer Andrew Cantle of England. While he concentrates on circling over Cork, Spanish Captain Jordi Sola Lopez is checking the weather at nearby airports. Surface wind is calm, visibility is 900 meters in fog. All copy, thanks very much. And uh, the weather, is it improving in Cork? At 9.35, the controller tells the captain the fog is lifted slightly. Visibility at touchdown zone is 500 meters. OK, in that case, any chance to perform one approach there? You are clear to land runway 17. Clear to land runway 17. After 30 minutes circling the airport, the crew must now shift focus to the complex task of getting their plane on the ground. We're good. I've landed and worse. Is coming in. The pilot confirms the plane is lining up with the runway. Okay, guys will be coming in. And they're descending at the correct speed. Speed's okay. I took control of their power, okay? The captain tells the first officer he'll adjust the engine power during the landing. That's fine, yeah. All the lights are on. Landing gear is down. Yes, the weather is much better here. So I was on the left-hand side of the plane, uh, looking out just behind the wing. And I remember I couldn't see anything, no runway, nothing at all. The captain pulls the thrust levers back to reduce power. Unexpectedly, the plane rolls hard to the left. What the hit? Go around. Go around. Hang on. I remember looking out the window and seeing grass about 10 foot below me. Well, I knew that wasn't good. I thought I was gone. I did for a minute or two. I thought I was gone. I thought, this is it. I'm, I'm out of here. That's all about it. The Canadian Arctic is one of the toughest environments on the planet. Winters here are brutal. Eight months long, with temperatures plunging to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. 
even now during the long days of the Arctic summer. The average temperature is barely above freezing. There are no roads to this part of the world. Virtually the only way to get here is by air. Resolute Bay Airport is the only one in the region equipped with navigational aids for automated landing approaches. First Air Flight 6560 is a charter flying passengers and cargo to the small community. Wind 180 degrees at eight knots. First Officer David Hare studied business before setting his sights on aviation. He joined First Air four years ago. First Air 6560, copy, thank you. Uh, there we go. Captain Blair Rutherford has been with the airline for more than 15 years. Might as well do yours too. Heading 029 degrees. Got it. This close to the magnetic North Pole, pilots need to calibrate their compasses frequently using their GPS. Okay, let's go over the approach. Okay. Altitude alert set to 2200. Because of the heavy fog, the crew will be relying on their autopilot during the approach. Checklist complete. Uh, autopilot. Set. This way, they don't have to worry about lining up with a runway visually. The computer will do all the work until they're ready to touch down. Sixty-five, sixty. You're landing on runway thirty-five. True. It's a little wet. Stairs 6560, copy, 35 true. We're 10 miles from runway. At 1140 AM, flight 6560 begins its final approach to the runway. Descending through 1,000 feet. First air 6560, we're three miles out on final. Uh, we're over the shoreline now. All right. Oh, up. The sound of an urgent alarm fills the cockpit. Oh, Go around. Go for it. Up. Up. It's the low altitude warning. To the pilots, it seems impossible. They don't even have the runway in sight yet. Go around. Go around, thrust. The captain decides to abort the landing but it may be too late. Flight 6560 slams into the ground at 180 miles an hour. The plane skids across the crest of a hill and bursts into flames. Thank you. With the cause of Flight 1404's crash evading investigators, the NTSB must now consider factors outside the plane that could have contributed to the Boeing 737's fate. We missing anything? No. No, we got all I need. NTSB senior meteorologist Don Ike will investigate the weather conditions at the time of the crash. Reports from the National Weather Service indicate there was a low pressure system in parts of Colorado around the time of the crash. But it had no impact on Denver International. There was no severe weather at the time. Runway 34's surface was bare and dry. Well, whatever it was, it happened real fast. The investigators now turn their attention to the crosswinds during takeoff. It looks like weather veining to me. Weather veining occurs when a crosswind pushes a plane's tail, causing the nose to point into the wind. A pilot must apply rudder to counteract this movement. A 737-500 can handle crosswinds up to 33 knots, but if the gusts are stronger, might have been enough to blow the plane off the runway. 
Bill English needs to confirm that the pilots weren't attempting to take off in crosswinds that exceeded the safety limits for the 737. All right, queue up ATIS. Main departure, runway three. Prior to takeoff, the pilots would have received the current weather conditions from the Automatic Terminal Information Service, or ATIS. Knots, active runway. ATIS reported winds of 280 degrees at 11 knots, well under the 33 knot threshold. But pilots don't just rely on ATIS. Air traffic control also provides specific runway winds right before takeoff. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The investigators speak with a controller on duty that night. Thanks for taking the time for us. Of course. OK, so what were the conditions at takeoff? Well, I uh, checked the winds just before. Continental 1404, wind 270 at 27. The controller told the crew to expect 27-knot winds on runway 34, a speed still below the crosswind limit of 33 knots. Anything else that could help explain what happened? No. I'm as stumped as you guys. Just after midnight, Ares Flight 8250 is carrying a plane load of tourists and locals from Bogota to the small Colombian island of San Andres, an ocean playground in the Caribbean Sea. There are signs of a thunderstorm in the distance. Now past the halfway point of the trip, the captain is increasingly concerned with the possibility of heavy storms gathering over their destination. It doesn't look like we're going to get any relief from this storm. Yeah, lots of activity tonight. Get a report from San Andreas for me. OK, I'll ask. The San Andreas air traffic controller is also keeping a close eye on changes to the weather. San Andreas, good morning. Ida City 250. Go ahead. We want to know how the weather is at the airport, please. Ida City 250, there is a thunderstorm over the airport right now. OK, Roger, thank you. Gear down. The weather in San Andres is changing fast. Air City 250, there's now heavy rain at the airfield and visibility will be reduced to five kilometers. In deteriorating conditions and just seven miles from landing, the captain confirms the procedure in the event they have to abort the landing at the last minute. In case we miss the approach, we go right, correct? Yes, correct, sir. 500 feet from the ground, the crew spots the runway. The captain lines up his plane. Air City 250 winds at 60 degrees at 15 knots. Then the wind picks up. 15 knots, head on. In case of wind shear, we use maximum thrust for a go around. Don't touch flaps or gear. Agreed, yes, sir. Caught in a sudden deluge, visibility decreases again. 50. Look out, Captain. The first officer now realizes they are too low to make a safe landing. 40. Can you make it? 30. 20. Climb, Captain! The captain pulls back on his control column. But it's too late. At 1.47 a.m., Ares 8250 slams into the ground with 131 passengers and crew on board. In the aftermath of the recovery, one passenger is dead after being hit in the chest by a tray table. 
A second passenger who is severely injured on impact dies in the hospital two weeks later. The Colombian Aeronautical Authority needs to find out what brought down one of the most widely used passenger planes on Earth. Parking brake, set. Detroit Metropolitan Airport. The crew of Northwest Airlines Flight 299 prepares to depart from Memphis. Man, I don't think I've ever seen fog this bad. In the tower, controllers are dealing with fog that's blanketed the entire airport. The ground controller clears Flight 299 to taxi to the active Runway 3 center. It will follow a series of taxiways known as Oscar, Foxtrot, and X-Ray that will take it to the runway's threshold. Northwest 299, what's your position now? OK, we just turned down onto X-Ray 299. Roger, switch to tower control 118.4. Roger. As Flight 299 nears the runway threshold, control of the plane passes from the ground controller to the tower controller. The 727 is now at the runway threshold, preparing for takeoff. Northwest 299 Metro Tower, runway 3 center, clear for takeoff. Roger. Flight 299 is cleared for takeoff. The 727 is seconds away from leaving the ground. But danger lies ahead. A DC-9 is stopped halfway down the runway. In the cockpit, Captain Bill Lovelace and First Officer Jim Schifferns are lost in the fog. This is a runway. Yeah. There's very little time to avoid a collision. I don't drop! Inside the DC-9, it's chaos. Firefighters and emergency response teams race to the scene. Eight passengers are killed making it the deadliest incident of its kind on U.S. soil in almost two decades. 